I want to talk about the things that I use on a regular basis that I haven't really seen a lot of other turners out there talk about. So within this video, I'm going to talk about seven different things, but within those pieces or in those categories, I'll also delve into some, some other little bits and bobs that I use within that category that help me within my wood turning practice. So first things first, I want to talk about chainsaws. So you might be looking at this big bopper of a chainsaw just here. This is the Still MS880, and this is the older version. I think there's an 881 now, and I'm not sponsored by any, anything in this video, but still, if you're listening, I'm open to. And I use this in particular. I also have another chainsaw, and I'm not trying to tell you to go out and buy this, by no means. This is when I get logs delivered, and I'll talk to you about how I get my timber and sourcing timber and that later on. But this chainsaw allows me to process the timber really quickly and it's an absolute beast of a chainsaw. It's the most powerful production chainsaw you can get on the market. I think the newer one is a little bit, has a little bit more horses, but this is a beauty of a chainsaw. If this is well and truly outside of what your needs are, I use this, a Makita in Australia, 240 volt, powered chainsaw. It's got the oil reservoir up there, but this Makita little 240 volt chainsaw is a beauty. And I use this because I was using the no bandsaw, no problem video. I'll link below a little card up here. If you don't have a bandsaw, use that because it comes in handy. Thank you very much, father-in-law for making it. But this here allows me to zip through and make the rounds when I use the templates and get it straight in on the lathe or along my back wall here, along my back wall, and then I start then. This is a beauty little chainsaw, just keep the bar nice and, the chain nice and sharp, keep the tension on, so you can just pull back that chain until you see that bottom link. But there's so many videos out there on YouTube about how to service your chainsaws, just go check one of them out and they're awesome. That there, is a great little chainsaw, not sponsored by Makita, but I just wanted to go from one real extreme chainsaw to a really lower end sort of, not as power, nowhere near as powerful as that one, but it still does a great job. When I do get the logs in and I'm processing them, you're probably wondering what this is here. And now this is called a cant hook. This is my best friend because it saves a lot of back breaking work. You hook onto the log and then you can move it with leverage up the top. Can't emphasize enough of how this has saved my back over the years and it's been a game changer for me when it comes to chainsawing. So this is a little stuff that I like, I wanna talk about within this video. Little bits and bobs you might not have thought of. In Australia, this is made by Snedden's Fencing Products. They make awesome axes too. But Snedden's in Australia, that's that's the cant hook that, I, that we use. And now, when I'm out there, I also use a steel ruler. You can just use a straight edge as well, but this is just as good because when I come back in, I just put it back up on my magnets. We'll talk about it later. But this steel ruler is the best. It acts as a straight edge. I can rule with it with either chalk or a nico, a permanent marker on the logs, and it saves you having to always find a straight bit of timber, might have a bow in it, this is always great and it lives, it just lives up, up there. And I've got four of them. I've got four steel rulers. You can never, never have enough rulers. I have my little measuring tools. So I've got this guy here. It's, it's been adapted to suit our needs. It's got a big nail up this end here and a nico down there, permanent marker. So that just helps when you've got an awkward bit of timber and you're trying to, you're trying to get your round pieces out of it. So comes in handy, a little little compass. And now I've got these. I went down to our local hardware store. These are templates. And I was a bit of a bin chicken and got some really thin bits of ply out of the bin, off cuts, and just come home and you just trace out the sizes that you need. So when you're processing out in your yard, you can just trace the circle, hit the dot, and then grab your smaller saw and work it around on the no band saw, no problem later. Before we got the forklift, I moved every bit of timber around with a removalist trolley. Removalist trolleys are great. You can find them on Facebook Marketplace for going really cheap. I really hope you're enjoying what I'm talking about and you're getting something out of it and you're, you're, you're seeing something, you're like, oh, I might be able to add that to my practice as well. Safety gear, 
<clears throat> chaps, safety eyewear, you can get the full shields, but safety eyewear, as well as some headphones, some, some Bluetooth or, or just your ear protection. Make sure you're always wearing PPE when you're doing any of this, goes without saying. But good set of chaps from Still and some headphones because you, you never know when you might get a phone call because we're very popular. This is an old ammo box. You could obviously use anything that you have laying around. But within the box, it keeps all the stuff that I use for servicing my chainsaws. So within here, I've got a sharpening jig that I, uh, I don't really use as much anymore. I've become a lot quicker and accurate at sharpening my chains by eye. So I just go back to the old, the old file that you can pick up from anywhere online. I said that I keep a whole heap of chains over there. There's another chain, heaps of files. I've got so many, so many files in there. But one really important thing that I always keep around are old paintbrushes without any paint on them. And the reason being, my father-in-law showed me, you can either use compressed air and air compressor, which is also a vital piece in my repertoire of wood turning, but cleans off around the caps before you open it up to fill your oil or your fuel. So paintbrushes, I've got them everywhere around, around the workshop and the other shed, and they help immensely just to clean the caps off before you pour your oil in. Because you don't want oil, you don't want oil mixing with any debris or sawdust and stuff like that and just becomes a pain in the ring. And now this is a, an electric sharpener. It sits in our vise and you drop it down like that. That's another thing that I use when I'm having a sharpening day. Number two on the list is PVA wood glue. PVA wood glue will be your friend when it comes to drying out your timber. And I've had a plethora of questions when it comes to drying timber, but this stuff, PVA wood glue, I use it neat in a Tupperware dish. Just make sure you don't take your partner's special Tupperware dish because you get in trouble, especially the ones with the measure, measurements on the side. Those ones apparently are important, but yes. Just a safety note, don't take the partner's Tupperware. PVA wood glue, and I use it straight. It comes, it's really, comes out white, as you probably have seen it a million times before, but I just wanna let people see it there. Comes out white like that. It's a very thick substance, a very thick material. Don't thin it down with water. If it's super thick and it's, I don't know, it's in winter time and it's quite real gluggy, just add a little bit of water to it just to make it easier for you to Get it on your brush. This is just a $6 fencing brush. How I apply it to the timber is by painting on the end grain only. So the tree grew up like this. We've cut it with the chainsaw and then we've sliced it down the center. We've turned our circle. We've put it on the lathe. We've turned the back and formed the tenon. That there is the way the tree grew. You paint it on the end grain only on both sides. I've, I've already turned this, but put it on the other end grain piece as well up to the tenon. I even put a little bit on the tenon as well. And I do that after I've cored all the bowls out. So this is a vital piece of kit to my wood turning as I can turn one blank into four blanks or three blanks, depending on the sizes I'm wanting to go for. I sell the smaller blanks on my website, on my DIY page to other wood turners and the seconds that might have a blemish in them or a little bit of a knot or something, I sell them on there as well. So if that interests you, email me or go check out my website. I then core all the blanks out like so on the left here, or your right. I keep them an inch thick, a little bit thinner down towards the tenon because you've got to account for that tenon. That's on the main bowl. Call them all out and then paint the end grain. I'll explain two other ways in a second. I then use spaces like this, normally an inch by an inch, so 25 mil by 25 mil. End grains coated, stick of them and stack them up. And then I put them in a protected area, normally just with a tarp over the top or a big sheet of tin, just so it allows that air flow through them, but not so they're gonna get that big gale force winds, big westerlies here in Southeast Queensland that we get. I put them in a slightly protected area around a few trees and it just allows the airflow to get to them, not in direct sunlight. And I leave them there for six months to four months, but I always use the PVA wood glue, stick of them, stack them up and put them away and forget about them, let them rest off and dry out. You're wondering how 
to dry your bowls out where you are in the world. Just talk to your local wood turners, you'll find one somewhere, or a local club, and they'll give you a hand on the, on the time frame that you need per inch. Another way of protecting your freshly turned blanks is you can just go down to your local hardware store, you buy this clean wrap. They're on these like industrial rolls, and you just roll it around it, and it keeps all the air from getting to the end grain. So that's another way of how to protect the end grain or the timber from drying out. When I'm turning my blanks, I always keep a tarp over the top of them. You've probably seen them in previous videos, just to keep that light or any wind off them. Mallet comes in handy for hitting things back into place. Another way of drying your timber is getting the shavings from when you're turning, putting the blanks in a cardboard box around all those shavings, closing that up, seal it up, and then write the date on the box. One word of warning when it comes to that is that some timbers can grow green and the spalting within the timber can, can change colors and you might not be as happy as what you would be if you air dried them. So this is just another way of drying timber that you might like to do. A big game changer for me is when I bought this snow plow mulching shovel, really, really broad and it's light and it allows me to just scoop a heap of shavings up and piff them into the trail or into bags and then I offload them to uh, animal shelters or things like that or into the garden. And also a rake, very handy with a nice sturdy, it's nice and strong, it's not one of those real flexible ones, it's a real strong one with a flat blade on the back that allows you to scrape the ground off as well. And the broom that I used is a soft bristle broom, not a hard broom, because it won't be able to pick up those real fine, small particles off your concrete. So soft bristle broom works an absolute treat. I know, but it, I use this daily. So invest in a good one. Number three are magnet trays. And I can't speak highly enough of how much they have been a game changer for my wood turning magnet trays because a lot of everything we use, all the little implements and, and dental tools and stuff, they're all made out of a metal. So magnet trays, this is a super, super long one. And I normally keep them, you would have seen them in my previous videos. I always have one on the headstock there and it just helps. You can just dump your stuff into it and it just has it, you've got it right there. So when you're turning away, you can reach up, grab what you need, bring it back down, get back to the job. So magnet trays, vital magnets in general are vital and you might see around here all these tools are being held up by magnets they will become your best friend i buy them off my local hardware store but you can also get these big trays from your repcos here in australia like a might be a canadian tire overseas a car auto service place where you go and get your you know your oils and windscreen wipers and stuff they'll sell those there so just be real careful with your magnet trays because the magnets can take the paint off the top of your lathe. So you can put a little bit of uh, sticky tape underneath the underside just so it doesn't, you know, make a blemish on your lathe. Just keep it in mind. But magnet trays, I've got them everywhere. Number four, measuring equipment. And now I've already spoken about the rulers before, the metal rulers. These are a set of calipers and you will use this stuff every time you turn, guarantee it. So these reach inside the bowl to the outside the bowl. There's different, different ways of doing it. So you can have large reaching around. Highly, highly suggest you go and invest in a set of calipers. I've got a link down in the description below, which is a Amazon affiliate link. If you click on it, you can support me a couple of cents. It all helps. But if not, find them somewhere cheaper, go get them. I've heard that the Andre Martel calipers are the creme de la creme, so go check those out as well. Vernier calipers, if you're using vernier calipers, you wanna soften that edge just there. So you just wanna soften those corners just so it doesn't get a catch. If you're gonna use them when you're doing any spindle work or something like that, have ones with that are really legible because my eyes sometimes play tricks on me and yes. What's that saying? Don't, don't blame the tool, blame the, you know. Spring calipers, amazing when you're doing your spindle work and you wanna get your tenons right, right bang on. I've got a few of them when I'm doing a, a longer project so I can just load them up so they're ready to go for each part. But spring calipers, good set to, to have. Dividers, when I use the tenon and I have them in the magnet tray 
every time. Also on the dividers, on the wall over here, on the wall just there, I have got the measurement for my chuck jaws that I use primarily. That way if I'm using that chuck and I haven't set up before I started turning and I've got the piece on the chuck already and I don't want to take it off because it might move it, unbalance it somehow, I can come over to the wall and just take the measurement off that little template that I've got. This is a homemade depth gauge. I've made a video about it, go check it out. I'll put it in the video description down below. But this is preventing me from going through the bottom of the bowls. I've since then put a little, like a little, got it from the kitchen. I saw Dino bought these little clips and I thought it might come in real handy. They're for sealing the top of bags and stuff. So you eat a bag of chips and you got to look, you seal it up, and put it in the pantry. You could put it on there, feed it through one of the holes, and that way, if you want to keep that measurement, it just allows you to, to keep that. If you want to move it, you can just, you know. Number five, a wood turning smock. And it's what I'm wearing right now. I've actually broken the zip on this one. It's the third zip that I've broken, and it's not because my belly is getting bigger. I'm getting a, a wood turning belly, speaking for myself, right? A wood turning smock will come in handy. They've got elastic cuffs down here on either side. They've also got the elastic around the neck so you don't get shavings down your shirt. I also wear an undershirt as well. It's just a, a Bonds short sleeve shirt, but that prevents it as well. But a wood turning smock will come in handy. I own several of them. You can store your pens, your pencils, your rulers. They're all there ready to go whenever you need them. So it just makes sense to go out and invest in a, in a smock if you're gonna be turning a lot and you can store all your stuff there at the ready and also having your magnet tray there just makes life a breeze. You don't have to go searching for stuff around. You've got it all on you, ready to go. Number six, a drill. And now every time I'm turning a piece, I use this drill. And the reason why I went to a corded version, a powered version is because I don't want it drying on me. And when you've got a big stack of bowls that you have to do, this is just so much more convenient. Plug it in and away you go. This was actually quite cheap from my local hardware store. It was the cheaper one of the auction. It's actually a little bit heavier than I would prefer, but this model here is the Makita, not sponsored, even though. Hotel Papa HP 1631. I've also got numerous Ryobi cordless drills as well that I just use for other jobs, odd jobs, but if you've got one, they will come in handy and it'll get you by until you can just go out get one of these and then you won't have to worry about someone needing to borrow your drill and there's no batteries that are charged and then you get in trouble. Now, having all your sandpapers organized is crucial and I also have my nursing trolley you might have seen me years before. Bowl gouges, like I've got my little, my little nursing trolley over here but I have all my sandpapers, little compartments. Another thing when it comes to sanding is these, your little Velcro attachment pieces, you put them in your drill, away you go. I've got a three inch, a two inch, and also a hard backed one. A, rubby, a rubber cleaning stick. Now, this is predominantly used on those belt sanders, you might have seen them on the belt sander, but when you're sanding and you want to clean the sanding disc off, you just hold it there like that and it cleans the sanding disc off because it might have got gummed up from something. It'll be good as new again and then you can sand again. So a rubber cleaning stick, you can pick them up everywhere. I'll put a link down below so you can find one. They will, because you will gum up your sanding paper and you'll think that it's buggered and you'll throw it away when it's still got another life in it. So it just saves you money in the long run. So number seven is networking. And for those that have got to this point in the video, I've got a little bonus tip for you as well. And what I mean by networking, I get asked all the time, where do I get my timber from? Where do I source it? Do I buy it? Do I pick it up? Networking with your local arborists will pay dividends in the future for you. And how I went about doing it is I jumped online, I looked up the local arborists within my area, if they had an Instagram page or a Facebook page, I sent them a message as well as gave them a phone call as well. What I went about doing is I said, hey, I'm a local wood turner, would you be open and willing to supply me with some timber? A caveat to asking for timber is that they will, they will give you everything and everything that they, that they have. If they're really open to sustainability and being environmentally friendly, which nine times out of 10, 99.9% .9 
of arborists and tree surgeons are. They, are. they want to be more sustainable in their practice, as does everyone else in this industry. So they will give you hardwoods, tough timbers, and things like that. So just be, just be mindful of that. When, you, when I first started, I should have asked for more softer timbers, had a bit more of an understanding, but I just wanted to get into it and get going. But now that I know that, just ask them if they've got any softer timbers that you can work with. And if they have something special coming up, just tell them, hey, thank you so much for all this timber. If there's something special coming up in the future, someone's birthday, you want to give a bowl to a client, just give me a heads up and I'll be more than happy to repay you the favor for dumping all this timber here. It's worked out dividends for me and what I'm doing. So just, and then that puts you at the forefront of their mind in what they're doing. And when they're cutting up a big, beautiful jacaranda, I'll keep this big piece for Kez. Camphor laurel, Keza, do you want some camphor laurel? Do you want some hardwoods? Do you want some... So just, just keep that in mind. And that's how I go about doing it and getting my timber and using the tools that I've spoken about today. So that's timber as well as contact your local men's shed, your local wood turning club, and just jump on social media. My social media link's just here to my Instagram page. Jump on there, shoot me a message or an email, which is my, in my about section on my YouTube channel here, and shoot me a message. And it just starts that network going and, and you can do a swap and exchange. People want bowl blanks, I sell bowl blanks. Write me an email and I post them all around the world. So. It just opens up other doors and we can all work together and learn from one another. And that's what I really enjoy about this community is we're coming up with fresh ideas all the time and oh, you know, someone might wanna know about that, you flick it to them and you're all interconnected that way. And then we can help each other out. Now, bonus tip. When you are turning green timber, I've found that lanolin, which is a sheep fat, I believe, uh, Corros anti-corrosive lubricant works an absolute treat. It's like a real, it's an oil. Um, Inox MX4 lanolin anti-corrosive, and I use that on the lathe bed, the everywhere I turn pretty much. Just keep it off the motor obviously, and just use it on parts that you need to be lubricated, but works an absolute treat. So to those out there that have reached this point in the video, I can't thank you enough for your support. And I've been emailing and messaging people back and forth. And I just wanted to also say thank you uh, to those people out there and for allowing me to be myself in these videos and allowing me to feel comfortable when I drop things or make mistakes to be able to do that and not chop that out of the video because that makes me feel more my authentic self and I've always wanted to keep those bits in, but I was really scared of perfectionism and, and my mind keeps going down that path. So thank you. You all know who you are, who write me messages and, and in the comments there. And I appreciate every, every one of you. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It, it goes a long way. So I will talk to you and see you all directly. Cheers.